Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Um, I hope that everyone has enjoyed uh, our presentations today. Uh, I was asked to present on parenting in Ramadan, and um, I think that this uh, uh, is something that a lot of people are, are having a lot of struggles with, uh, especially given the fact that now uh, kids are at home. Uh, most parents would expect their children to be outside between eight and three, and uh, now they're stuck at home. And, um, and most parents, especially mothers, have to play a uh, dual role um, and you know that kind of creates a lot of uh, tension in the house for children um, and for also for couples as well because mothers are, are overwhelmed um, and so <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about that and I'm going to go over some basic principles and then uh, maybe go some uh, a bit in detail into more specific uh, issues um, so let me just make sure that I'm able to get my presentation uh, okay, so we'll talk about parenting. I'll talk about attention, attunement, uh, importance of sleep, and screen time, which is a big thing now for everyone because of the quarantine. Um, and uh, what role does that play in parenting now, especially in Ramadan? Um, and then, you know, bringing it all together, uh, talk about what I mean by proper command. We'll get to that, inshallah, soon. So, um, you know, parenting, obviously, I don't know if you would agree with me or not, but at least I always tend to say that probably one of the most important, if not the most important aspect of, uh, uh, of our lives that affects our, our functioning and uh, shaping us into who we are as adults. Uh, uh, as a clinician, I believe that I can identify pretty much most major psychological issues that I've encountered to uh, back to parenting. Um, and it's not always the case, so I don't want people to feel guilty if their children are having, or if even uh, adult children are having any psychological issues, because at the end of the day, our aqidah still is that it's Allah who guides uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's not up to us. So you can have a parent like Nuh alayhi salam and still have children that were not Muslims, like his son in the Quran. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we do our best uh, as parents. Um, and we have to make sure that we do our best, that uh, we raise uh, good, uh, well-mannered children, balanced children, um, but uh, the ultimate outcome is not really up to us. Um, and I think if uh, the issue of control and outcome is not apparent to us now with this whole coronavirus, maybe it'll never be, become apparent to us, uh, because in this time, uh, we uh, are all powerless. Uh, and we've come to a point where we have to accept that we don't have control over everything. Um, now, in most cases, what happens with parenting is that people tend to repeat the same parenting style that their own parents had. Um, because when you're growing up, we're social learners. We learn from other individuals around us. So how to behave as a parent, we learn from our parents. How to behave as a husband or a wife, we learn from our parents. Um, or others that are around us, at least uh, you know, within uh, the place that we're living, other caregivers and, and uh, those that we interact with primarily. And so parenting, uh, we tend to repeat. And if our parents made some mistakes, uh, we tend to repeat those mistakes. And just the fact that if you repeat the same parenting style over time, uh, it's not going to work, right? So, uh, you know, this uh, uh, saying in Arabic, which gets associated with Ali ibn Abi Talib, but it's not, you know, we don't know the authenticity of it. Um, but it, it's a very good saying. It says, don't, don't raise your children like your parents raised you because they have been created in a different time than, than your time. And so, you know, now, especially, I mean, I, I'm sure that maybe this is just a bias because I'm living in this time, but I feel like the difference that existed between 1940 and 1980 um, was not as much as the difference that exists between 1980 and 2020. But again, maybe I'm biased in my, my opinion um, uh, of that, but times move fast and times change. So my parents who might've grown up in uh, you know, 50s um, and I in the 80s, uh, you know, and my children that are grow growing up now, um, there's different time, time zones and time frames, and we have to keep that in mind when we're raising our kids. Um, now parenting has been shown in research uh, to be a strong variable that predicts uh, childhood illnesses, accidents, teenage pregnancy, substance abuse, truancy, school problems, underachievement in education, child abuse, and then later in life, uh, you know, any kind of uh, crimes, uh, any mental illness, or even unemployability. So uh, it is a very important factor, and we want to make sure that we do the best that we can. 
Um, so obviously uh, Ramadan uh, is coming up soon. We have the situation of coronavirus and being quarantined in our houses. So it creates a lot of layers of complications. And uh, there's some things that we're gonna make sure that we uh, are mindful of. Um, and we don't want to have development of resentment, uh, whether it's towards our children or for them to develop negative feelings towards us. Um, and it will definitely happen if parenting is not done properly. So uh, we wanna make sure that we don't get to that point um, you know, where we are reacting emotionally towards our children or where they're reacting emotionally towards us. Um, so, you know, inshallah, we'll talk a bit about some of these things. First thing I want to talk about is attention. And when I'm talking about attention here, what I'm talking about is the, the attention that, that children uh, need from us um, at a very young age, and then even continuing on as adults. I mean, uh, I'm sure that you can identify someone that you love, that you like, that you adore, whether it's your spouse or your parent or your friend, um, that you want attention from. So even as adults, we seek attention, but for children, attention is a very uh, important factor because it tends to be the reinforcer. Um, so uh, generally, you know, you can divide attention into positive, neutral, and negative. So like uh, uh, negative attention is easy. You, when you get somebody, when you belittle them, but you're still uh, attending to them, right? You're looking at them, you're talking to them. Um, neutral is, you know, when you're just passively listening to them, which is what most people tend to do right now, unfortunately, like even when we're trying to interact with our parents when we're trying to, uh, our children, we're trying to talk to them, uh, it's really uh, neutral and it's not really uh, a positive one. Positive attention would entail when you're actually actively playing with them, laughing with them, you know, tickling them, you know, spending that that one-on-one -on -one time with them and giving, in, giving them that positive attention. Now, you know, obviously too much of anything is bad, right? Um, uh, not giving any attention at all is probably the worst thing you could do. It's that's a form of neglect. Uh, and there's a saying, and some research should support that as well, that negative attention is better than no attention because it still ends up reinforcing the behavior. But at the end of the day, we want to avoid the negative attention. Sometimes you do have to, you know, discipline your children. You have to reprimand them. Uh, and that might be considered negative attention. And this is why I have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, I modified this to just, uh, 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 kind of talk about what I believe is, uh, is a, a you know, proportion of how much negative attention we should give overall. So if we're talking about overall attention that we give, generally it's gonna be po passive or positive, I mean, passive, positive or neutral attention. And then there's gonna be some positive attention and there's gonna be a little bit of negative attention that, that also is there. Um, so I'm not saying that you shouldn't you know, discipline your children by all means. Um, but when you do it, how you do it, and uh, you know how much of you do it, it, it plays a huge role. Um, and so, uh, when you do give attention, though, then you have to look at how good of a quality are you giving that attention. So, you know, this I'm just putting this story in here just to kind of consider and, and to uh, you know make sure that I, I get the point across. Uh, if you consider like a four-year-old boy, he's playing on the floor when his father comes back from work. Uh, you know, father's tired, wants to wind down. Uh, the child wants the father's attention. He calls out to the father to tell him about some pretend play that he's engaged in. Um, the father, while standing up, looks at him and says, oh, wow, that's wonderful, you know? And it's good that he actually acknowledged and he was able to even interact with the child, which a lot of parents sometimes can't do or not able to do or forget to do. Um, but there wasn't a proper, properly attuned interaction. And that attunement is important if you want the attention and the interaction to be um, positive, right? To be, uh, to be good. Um, and so uh, ideally for, for this father to be attuned with his child, he would have to do the following. And this is again, an ideal case scenario, put away anything, everything that's in his hands, get down on the ground at the same level as the child, right? Physically um, and speak to him at the same level too. So same tone and volume, um, if the child is talking in a child language, you want to use the same, you know, type of language um, and then engage and pretend uh, as if the father is playing and enjoying it uh, and then give uh, positive emotional attention, right? Laugh, be sad, whatever the, the pretend play that's happening. And then when you say, wow, that's wonderful, that has a more meaningful effect for children. And the question that's come up, which is a, a very good question that comes up very often is that, you know, people who are, people are generally afraid to give attention. Um, because, uh, you know, they either have too much negative attention and it creates sort of a trauma. Um, again, giving no attention is, is the worst thing that you can do for children. 
And so uh, I would say that the, for everybody who feel like they gave uh, too much negative attention, then that they need to work on that and identify why is it that I interact in a very negative way with my kids? Why am I always yelling at them? Um, maybe you're not doing the opposite when you're feeling happy and interacting with them or when the kids are in a good mood and you're interacting with them. On the other hand, you also have to keep in mind that uh, your own mental health uh, is at stake when you're, you know, when you're interacting with people. So if I'm feeling tired, if I'm feeling anxious, overwhelmed, and then I'm being asked or I'm, I feel like I have to or somehow the child wants my attention, um, it's not going to be a good one, right? It's going to end up uh, being a very negative uh, attention that I give them and uh, that's not going to help the relationship or the development of the child. Um, so it's important to keep that uh, keep that in mind. Um, and um, on the uh, so 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 with that again, when you do give attention, you have to be attuned to the child's needs. So if, for example, your child is talking to you about some problem that they're having, you want to make sure that you also can empathize with that. You're attuned to that uh, the need of the child, and you're not um, you know speaking at your own in your own uh, zone. Uh, you're in the zone of the child. Um, that's going to be more more effective. Um, then I want to talk about sleep now, because again, in Ramadan, uh, sleep usually is disturbed because of the whole coronavirus issue. Sleep becomes a problem. Sleep play I, to me again, probably in general mental health, the most important aspect that relates to our mood and functioning. If sleep is affected, uh, everything is affected, uh, and you can take a very healthy person and take away their sleep, and it's going to affect them in a very very negative way. Um, there's a lot of studies on it, how sleep affects your physical health as well as your uh, psychological or emotional health. I listed some things here, you know, generally. So for children, it's going to be important that they get uh, their sleep, which is on time, and it's sufficient sleep. So it's not, uh, you know, uh, generally what ends up happening if there's no structure, people sleep late, and they're waking up at like 11, 12, 1, 2, sometimes during the day, um, and uh, at night they're up very, very late. The, the quality of sleep that you're going to get uh, if you sleep between, say, uh, midnight and 2 a.m. Uh, is going to be a lot better, even if you got the same amount or more uh, quality of sleep like uh, early in the morning or, or earlier in the day. So it matters and it affects the, your mood. And you can test it out and maybe, maybe some of you are already indirectly unintentionally testing it out right now. So for children, it's going to be very important that they uh, sleep on time and that they get uh, healthy sleep. So how do we fix that? Because I want to make sure that it's as practical. Um, uh, first, fixing the place of the sleep, right? So for children, um, they should have, of course, if they're old enough, they're, they should have their own beds uh, from a very younger age. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't physically interact with them or hold them. And sometimes children even sleep with their parents uh, at a young age. But after a certain point, they should be in their own bed. Now, their bed should not be used for anything else but sleeping. Um, and younger children, if you want them to be trained well, they should not sleep anywhere else except for their bed, right? So on one hand, they're not going to be playing with toys on their bed or, um, you know, using their iPad or whatever on their bed. On the other hand, uh, they're not going to be sleeping anywhere else in your bed, for example. So for very young kids, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a, a general rule that we talk about, like if you want to train them to sleep in their own beds, um, usually what parents do is that the, the kid will fall asleep on the parent's lap or while they're holding the child up or while the, the child is in their bed and then they'll move that, the child to, to their bed, but that doesn't work. Uh, why? Because the child is already sleeping. So ideally when they're sleepy and when they're about to fall asleep is when you want to move them to their own beds um, so that they associate sleepiness and resting to their beds and no place else. The other thing which is very important for all of us, this is a general rule, but also for children, especially is preparing for sleep, right? We generally don't do a lot to prepare for sleep. And what ends up happening is that when we try to fall asleep, we can't fall asleep. And so it's important. And some things I give here, like dimming the lights after sunset, you know, taking a warm bath at night or a shower at night, um, not eating anything close to sleeping time, not having any kind of physical rigorous activity, um, or anything that increases the activity of your mind. So like playing video games or watching uh, TV before sleep, um, you know, it's probably one of the worst things. And we'll talk about screen time with children. It's probably one of the worst things you can uh, to disturb your sleep. And so we have to make sure that we don't, uh, we prepare for sleep before going to sleep um, so that uh, we're able to sleep on time 
um, a lot of people report like they, they're trying to fall asleep, but they can't fall asleep. So they get up and they go on their phones. That's probably the worst thing you can do for your sleep because of all the light that goes into your brain and the brain thinks it's daylight and, you know, it stops secreting me melatonin. Um, so for children, it's important as well. But, you know, one thing I want to say as a general principle of parenting, um, which I should have said sooner, is that uh, whatever you're trying to the, for, for the children to take on as a habit, you have to also model the behavior. This is the prophetic sunnah of Rasulullah This is the only way in psychology. A lot of times people ask the question, how do I get this person to do something? Whether it's your husband or your child or your you know, parents or whomever. And the answer is you can never get somebody to do something until they themselves can get, get you know, to be motivated to do it. Uh, when kids are young, you might be able to force some things, but that doesn't work and it doesn't last long. When kids hit a certain age, they're gonna rebel. And when they're independent, they'll stop doing the behavior, just like, for example, prayer, right? So yes, there's some level of strictness that goes into it and instruction and, you know, uh, like uh, um, uh, remi reminders that you give children. But as a general rule, if you want a behavior to be instilled in another person that's, uh, you know, probably lives with you, uh, especially your child, you have to model the behavior. You have to be able to uh, show the child, this is how it's done. And uh, not only that, but uh, it's also going to tell the child that when you tell them to go to sleep, but you're awake and you're on your phone or you're not you're sleeping, then they're going to think that you're a hypocrite. Naturally, they might not say it, but, you know, that is the uh, definition of it. So, you know, they'll think, well, why aren't you going to sleep? So uh, as a general principle, I always tell parents when you're uh, if you want to instill a habit in your uh, kids, for example, parents will say, I want kids to do homework or I want them to have time off of their screen. So I'll say, do it as a family so you can uh, model the behavior for them and it'll make it easier for them to follow through as well. So screen time. Now, uh, one of the most common uh, you know, uh, issues that people bring their children in, uh, at a, especially at a young age, is when they're having behavior problems. Like the person, the child can't sit still, the person gets too emotional, loses focus, gets distracted. And if you take them to a, a physician who doesn't do a proper assessment or a psychologist, um, most of the time they'll diagnose them with uh, ADHD. Um, the psychiatrist or the medical doctor will prescribe medications. Even the psychologist might refer them to the medical doctor for medications and uh, the kids will take the medication. And the, the cool thing about the medication is that if you know anybody who's having issues with attention, whether it's related to ADHD or not, if you take any stimulant medication, you're gonna feel more attentive. That's just the medication works, right? It's like anybody who takes anxiety medication will feel more relaxed. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the child has ADHD or, you know, they have anxiety. So uh, now that the research is coming out, what we're learning is that screen time tends to mimic some of these symptoms. Um, and these children who are on their screens a lot um, uh, are, you know, uh, end up being diagnosed with ADHD, being put on medications, uh, and they're having emotional issues and whatnot. Now, why do children look at screens? Because, well, they learn from us. We're looking at screens. I'm talking to you through a screen and you're looking at me through a screen. So, you know, it's a behavior that's very common in these days. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we're surrounded by screens with e-learning and schools being closed. You know, children have to look at screens. And so, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's one reason they're learning from adults. Uh, it's also addicting. Playing video games is addicting. Uh, watching uh, shows is addicting. Just being on the screen can be addicting as well. Um, and sometimes there's personality and developmental factors. What do I mean by that? Um, there can be kids like who are more introvert or who don't like to be physical, physically active. I have two sons. The one is very, you know, mellow, kind of like me, likes to sit and do things. The younger one is very active, likes to run around, you know, uh, cause chaos and, and, you know, be physically active. Uh, always wants to play hide and seek and all sorts of games. Um, so their personality will determine how much time they'll spend on screens. Um, the other thing is developmental. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, I've had children, I had one uh, case where a child was on uh, his screen a lot and was watching a lot of YouTube and, and he was in, in middle school, I believe. And uh, what uh, we determined was that um, when I talked to him about it, um, he actually felt like he had a more of a closer relationship with one of the YouTube celebrity or e-celebrity than he had with his own parents. So sometimes there's developmental emotional factors, like there's a void that's been left because of an absent parent, whether it's intentional or unintentional, accidental, but 
that void is being filled through, you know, um, through uh, like having a, a celebrity that you follow on YouTube, or there's emotional problems and uh, video game is uh, a way for the child to escape from those emotional problems. So those uh, can also be reasons for, for screen attachment. And screen time has been associated, this is the research that I pulled up uh, that's more recent with weight gain, obesity, stress, depression, inattentiveness, hyperactivity, uh, sleep problems, and mood and behavior. So some of those you can see are, um, you know, if you took a child and there wasn't proper assessment done, they would be diagnosed with, uh, you know, anxiety or uh, depression or even um, ADHD and, and most likely put on medications. Now, um, what can you do with screen time? So you cannot avoid it. And I don't really say that you should avoid, you should just tell them the kids to not do any screen time at all. So again, I'm gonna go over some general and then more specific for children. So um, screens, I, I feel if, if possible should be avoided, right? So for example, if there's an option of the child to be playing a board game with the parent, because obviously again, parent can't be on the screen and expect the child to be playing a board game. Um, but if that's possible, then that should be done. Um, and then if you're, um, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if there's a way for it to do have some physical activity, then that should be, uh, you know, done as well, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, to avoid uh, the screen time and then to avoid continuous screen time. So, you know, some of these symptoms that I talked about before, like inattentiveness and especially emotional issues and stress. One of the things that screen does to our brains or the children's brains even, or even adults, is it puts it into a fight or flight mode just the screen itself. So it could be even passive screen time, but especially if it's like a game or some show that they're watching, you know, and when that sympathetic nervous system is activated, the child is gonna be uh, activated and, and hyper and emotional. So um, avoid continue. So one of the ways to do it is to avoid to take a break. Um, and so the child uh, is not looking at the screen for a very long time. Um, if it's an important task, break it down. You know, I have a 10, 10 rule, which is like, if you're looking at a screen for 10 seconds, uh, sorry, 10 minutes straight, then look away for 10 seconds. If you work in, a, in an environment, like I'm in my basement right now, uh, I tend to look at my window, look outside, just to kind of take my eyes off from the screen and then look back uh, as needed. Um, and then do a screen time fast if possible. But sometimes that's not easy to do, especially nowadays with, with all the e-learning and, uh, and working from home. Um, there's a question that says that, how do you manage your children who's switching between schoolwork and YouTube, especially when having other kids? So I think the question is like, maybe the parent is not looking or, or watching over the child and the child is, you know, uh, looking at YouTube instead of school time. So I'll talk a little bit about that in scheduling, but I can mention one thing, which is that it is not possible for the child to be engaged in an educational activity for longer than a certain period of time, right? Um, I think schools in general, the rule of having this child be attentive for 50 minutes for a class uh, or an hour for a class and for eight hours straight, I think that's that to me as a, as a general principle wasn't a good idea to begin with. Um, and now we're learning that you can probably shrink all that uh, time into a few hours and still get the same results. In fact, they did a study in, I believe it was uh, uh, California, but I could be wrong. Maybe it was Seattle but uh, somewhere where they um, sh shortened the, the, the length of school day and uh, the productivity actually went up. So the child is not generally going to like to pay attention to that for too long. It's not going to help. So I would say that I would set some, some um, time frames, like half an hour, you do schoolwork uh, and then you get a break. You know, for five or 10 minutes, you could do this or 45 minutes, you do this and then you get 15 minutes off. That usually works better. In fact, the Japanese have this technique they use called the Pomodoro, which I really like is that after every 25 minutes, you take a five minute break. So people who are doing continuous work, even people who are working from home, you know, take five minute break helps them to kind of rejuvenate and come back and then get back to work again. And after three or four of those phases, you take a longer break. So you, we can't expect the kids to do that. Uh, and I think if you have a balanced schedule, um, and we'll talk about that, that might help uh, mitigate that. So for children, uh, again, talk to children about negative effects, okay? Children are much, much smarter than we think, right? We think that um, they're not gonna get it. Uh, I've had multiple uh, uh, clients who were brought in children you know, for this issue of screen time. I sat with them, I went over books and research on how screen time affects them negatively. And that in itself was sufficient for them to be motivated for at least a couple of months to like stay away from screen as much as possible or to, to limit their time. So talk to them about it, let them know what the concern is. And if you're also 
portraying the same behavior, meaning you're also modeling the same behavior, then ideally shouldn't be that big of a problem. Now setting a limit. So you have to be realistic with setting a limit. I'm not a big fan of just saying screens whatsoever because A, it's not possible and B, it's not going to be realistic. You cannot implement that realistically. The world that we live in, unfortunately, we are surrounded by screens. Unless you live in a country or in a place where that's not the case, um, saying no, completely no to a screen is, is not possible in my opinion. Um, so I would say outside of the work that is required, schoolwork or like FaceTime with family members, uh, limited to like one or two hours a day or two to three hours uh, you know, during weekday or two to three hours during weekends. So, you know, it sounds a lot, one to two hours, but that might be better. That might be more doable for the child rather than saying, some parents have said, oh, the only, I, we don't give them screens during the weekday at all. I mean, it might be working and it, uh, hopefully the child will continue on and, and that would be ideal. But I think that given the, the environment that we live in, the atmosphere we live in, how everything is on our phones and on screens, I think that, that the kind of strategy doesn't always work. So be mindful of that. Uh, so give them the time that they actually uh, need, that they actually want. And then if you're using the principle of taking, you know, um, like not having continuous time, um, then, you know, it, it's not going to be as bad as, as having continuous like four to six hours of like YouTube or whatever the kids are doing. Um, and then if you're going to replace that time off the screen, it has to be with something fun, right? Like you cannot expect a child to stop playing a video game and read a book, like unless there's already some interest in that it's an interesting book that they've been looking forward to reading, you know? So you have to find creative ways um, to get them engaged and they need to be engaged. Otherwise the, they're gonna wanna go back to the screens because that's what the screen does. It's a continuous flow reinforcement that you're getting again and again and again. You push a button, something happens. You win something, you, some prize happens. You know, someone interacts or the character jumps on the screen. That kind of reinforcement has to be happening if you're choosing an alternative, right? Uh, it's not gonna be that they're gonna just move away from that and enjoy other things that might be apparently boring to them. And then, like I said, you have to practice what you preach. Uh, you cannot expect them to be off of devices if, the, if you're gonna be on them as well. Um, uh, the question is that same for the toddlers? I would say like the principle is the same, right? Like you, uh, avoiding screen time as much as possible. I, I would think that toddlers who are very, very young should not even be on the screen, but again, it's not doable. So just setting a limit. Hey, let's do 20 minutes of, of watching, you know, whatever they're watching on, on YouTube or the TV, and then we'll go out and we'll play. Or after 20 minutes, we'll run around uh, the house for like five minutes. So we'll play hide and seek for like, you know, 10 minutes. And then we can go back to screen again. So taking that break is gonna be extremely helpful. Um, now I talked about reinforcements. So I wanna talk about conditioning because that plays a huge role especially early on in the life. You know, human beings, I mean, we don't, as Muslims have the aqidah that we, we evolved from animals, but we do, uh, uh, you know, there is conceptualization that uh, a lot of scholars have done on us having animalistic like ruh tendencies, even the nafs having this kind of like cattle-like behaviors that we have of pleasing ourselves and moving away from pain. Those things are, are, are true for us as human beings. So conditioning is part of, like the way we the way we function right why is it that it's so addicting to have a phone right getting messages or text messages or email is so addicting why do people check emails again and again it's part of conditioning because we've been conditioned um to randomly receive it and we'll talk about schedules of reinforcement but it's so random it happens so randomly that we're um, we're looking forward to it when it happens it rewards us in so many ways so there's a few principles i want to make sure that i um i talk about uh, one is classical conditioning, um, and this has a lot to do with, I don't know if you, if you went through any high school psychology or college psychology class, you would know about Pavlov and his dog and how he got the dog to salivate with, um, you know, with the bell. Uh, so it's pairing something uh, good with something bad and then presenting it to the child. And over time, whatever, not bad or something neutral or something that's not as, you know, as good, over time that becomes uh, a reinforcer for the child. So one practical example would be like if um, uh, if you um, if you spent uh, time with a child, uh, like let's say they're watching screen time and you spend time with them, right? So you're reinforcing that behavior through spending time with them, like physically act actively. Then if you took away the screen, they might still feel the same level of reward or the same level of uh, pleasure by spending time with you. So it's pairing the two together. Um, operant conditioning, which plays a, a bigger role, I believe, because Operant condition functions uh, mainly on the principle of how the behavior is changed based on what happens afterwards, not what happens during or before. 
So two things that you've probably heard of is rewards and punishment. And that those are two principles that come from operant conditioning. The word reward is also translated as reinforcement. So reinforcement and punishment. Um, <clears throat> so for our children, it's gonna be important that we reward them or we punish them uh, in a way that is more effective, especially in Ramadan too, right? So, you know, uh, when they're doing a certain behavior, if you reward them, and let's say if the reward or punishment is not consistent with the behavior, and we do this a lot. So for example, we'll tolerate a behavior, a child is watching TV uh, or not getting off the, the screen, and uh, you know, you'll tolerate for like five days, and on the sixth day, you're like, okay, fine, I'm taking away your iPad. Well, that's not consistent, you know, it, 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 and it's not even justified with the behavior, right? Sometimes parents will say, if you don't listen to me, if you don't eat, you know, your, your, your vegetables or whatever, uh, no iPad for you tomorrow or no Xbox for you tomorrow. That's, that's not a justified uh, punishment for the behavior. So it has to be consistent and justified. Just like you wouldn't reward a child like $20 for eating their vegetables every day because it's too much. It's not consistent or justified for the behavior. You shouldn't punish the children like that either. The other thing is it has to be immediate. The, more, the closer the time between the reward and punishment and the behavior, the more effect that it will have. So for example, and you know, uh, the, the fourth bullet point, I'll talk about that while we're talking about this example, that if your child is acting out in public, let's say they're in the store, they're in the masjid, they're running around, they're acting out, they're being too loud, um, you have to immediately talk to them about that behavior. Uh, but you should never do that in public. You should never shame your children in public that it has absolutely no effect on children. When I say public, I mean in front of anybody else, whether it's their sibling, whether it's their um, you know, friends or cousins or, or the general public. So, but it has to be immediate. So pulling your child to the side, you know, taking them to the shoe room in the masjid or wherever and saying, hey, you, know, you were loud, that wasn't good. Uh, uh, it's not tolerated, here's your punishment for it, right? Um, uh, you know, if you, I used to reward my kids with ice cream and I would take them to the masjid. So you know, if they were being loud, I would say, okay, fine. You know, we're not gonna get some ice cream now because you guys were loud. Uh, not guys, at least one of the child. So uh, it has to be immediate, uh, but you have to keep in mind that you don't want to shame the child either. What do I mean by schedules and reinforcement? Um, so reinforcement, when you look at, uh, again, reinforcement being what predicts the behavior, whether it's something that's going to happen more frequently or less frequently, um, uh, you have to look at uh, the reinforcer itself. So let me give an example of, uh, of a slot machine. Why is slot machine so uh, addicting for people? Because um, when people play or generally gambling, when you gamble something, um, you don't, it's not like every fifth turn, you're going to win a reward. That doesn't usually happen. It's a random number that's decided. And even time-wise, it's like random uh, increment or interval of time um, that is decided for when you were going to win uh, a reward or an award from it. So we have to be creative with our children too. What do I mean by that? So let's say, for example, if you uh, reinforce your child's behavior of doing homework, by giving them screen time. If you said, hey, after every half an hour of reading your book, you get 10 minutes of screen time. That will work, but only for a little while. Why? Because it's too repetitive, right? There's no, var there's no variability in how much you're rewarding and how often you're rewarding. So what you wanna do is you wanna change it up a little bit. You might say like you know, every nth time, it, does, it can be a random number, that um, you're gonna get 15 minutes of screen time after you do this work. So the child is like, oh, wow, you know, 15 minutes. I was expecting five or 10, but I got 15. You might say, okay, this time you're only gonna get five minutes of screen time. Um, this time, maybe you won't get any screen time, right? Maybe you'll get a dollar or something. Like it has to be different things. It has to be different in time intervals. Uh, that will have a bigger effect on, on people. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times people ask like, oh, when I, got, when I started a job, uh, I really liked the pay and it was very motivating, but now it's not motivating anymore. One of the reasons is because paying gets so repetitive and so similar. After every two weeks, you're getting the same paycheck. After every two weeks, you're getting the same paycheck. It might be a lot more than what you expected, what you wanted, but it loses its, its pull after a while. And that's, that's why we have to be creative with children and make sure that we also um, keep it more interactive and um, uh, uh, interesting for them. Okay, so proper command. So what do I mean by proper command? This is a very important because this comes up a lot with children when they're referred to me. Um, one of the things that people will do is that they'll say, when I'm talking to my child, or, or I had a complaint of a parent said, you know, I would call my child to come and eat with us, uh, come eat dinner, but he won't put away his controller or his uh, iPad and, and come join us. 
And then, so then I would ask the mom, like, what did you say? Like, what, what, what did you, what exactly did you say? Well, I said, dinner's ready. Um, or I said, uh, you know, dinner time. That's not a proper command. That's, that's stating a fact. Dinner is ready or dinner time is just a fact. It's a factual statement. You have to issue a proper command. What does that mean? You have to, A, have the attention of the child. So ideally going at their level, like I said, attuned with them, sit in front of them, look into them, get their attention, look at me. Then you have to issue the command, say, hey, I need you to come downstairs and eat dinner with us because it's time to eat dinner, right? So you're asking them, telling them exactly what to do. And you are, uh, 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 you know, um, telling them why that's important too. So the why also is important, the what is important and the when is important. Like right now I need you to do this. And then if a child responds, you have to, uh, uh, you know, reinforce that behavior. So if they're, if they're complying, immediately praise them. Praise is a big factor when it comes to reinforcing. If they're not complying, you reprimand. Hey, if you don't do this, you're gonna have this punishment. Again, whatever the punishment is, has to be consistent. It has to be immediate. Wait for a response. You notice the child was on his phone or the teenager could be, and then they start putting their phone down. Okay, they're complying. Say something nice to them. You know, thank you so much for listening. You're such a wonderful child. Uh, I love uh, how you listen to me when I tell you to do something. That's a wonderful thing for any child to hear from their parents. But you have to, it has to be immediate. If the child is still, com if the child is complying, great. Praise them and you get the job done. If they're not complying, then you can impose an immediate consequence, right? But then at the end of consequence is the, uh, whatever that they, you were asking, is it, is it still there? Is the task still needs to be completed? Then you go back to issuing the proper command. But a lot of times parents struggle with that because they're not giving the proper command. They're expecting the child and even adults, by the way, we think that other person knows what we're thinking and they can read our minds. Nobody can read anyone's mind. You have to be very clear in your communication. I mean, the Quran tells us to do the same thing, that you have to be very straight and clear with the communication. Tell them exactly what you want, when you want it, how much you want it. Um, and then if they don't comply, then, then you can go into that. Okay, and then the scheduling, uh, I said earlier, I was gonna go into. Uh, first and most importantly, make the child part of this process. You sit with a child and say, look, you have this much homework. The homework requires you to work four hours a day or five hours a day, hopefully not more than that. Um, and then you also have time, you know, uh, in, Ram in Ramadan, we're going to read Quran, we're going to pray, you have free time, you know, fun time, you can play, you can do this, do that. So let's sit and design the schedule. Let's make sure that uh, we come up with a schedule that you can follow. It doesn't have to be set in stone. It doesn't have to be something that cannot be changed. It's fluid, it's flexible, but it has to be very specific, okay? Um, the schedule can't be unfair either. Like I said, you cannot expect a child to be studying for two hours or reading Quran for one hour. It's almost impossible for children these days to do that. So you do half an hour, 15 minutes. We know as Muslims that 15 minutes of, of proper Quran reading is much more valuable than what sometimes people tend to do in Ramadan is I want to finish one Quran in Ramadan. So they sit there in half, in half an hour, quickly read through a juz and you know th that is an accomplishment. I personally don't see that as an accomplishment because you're not having that kind of connection with the Quran. Uh, ideally you should have that and children should have that too. So make sure that it's something that's not harsh or unfair. It's balanced and it doesn't take too much time for, for any of the tasks. So I'm gonna end with that because again, uh, I talked about a lot of different principles and I wanna make sure that uh, I, um, you know, if there's any questions, I wanna answer those as well. But um, just, uh, you know, a, a lot of this is, is uh, too much stuff to take in and apply. Um, there's a lot of books out there that you can uh, refer to. There's a really uh, by Dr. Hisham um, uh, and it's called Parent-Child Relations. It's a, like a textbook on Islamic parenting. Um, and, and you can always contact me. My email address is here. Uh, if you need any, any uh, books on, on parenting, if you have any questions on parenting. Parenting is not an easy task. You know, being a clinical psychologist, I struggle with it as well. So I cannot expect, and you shouldn't expect yourself to be experts on any of these issues. Um, we do the best we can, uh, and that, that's really what matters at the end of the day to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And in Ramadan, uh, at the end of the day, make dua for your kids, because a, a parent's dua is much more, more valuable and effective for the child. Um, so with that, inshallah, we'll, and I also want to let you guys know about Khalil Center. Uh, we're off for web therapy, so if you have any, uh, if anyone's having any issues, uh, please refer to us. Please request the, the service. Uh, we can provide counseling through, uh, you know, through the, uh, the internet without any issues, inshallah. Um, we get, we're getting a lot of people now who are very poor, 
um, they they can't afford. Uh, so we offer financial assistance as well. So if anybody needs uh, and they can't afford it, we'll help them out. But on the other hand, I'm also requesting that you guys also support Khalil Center and uh, make sure you give, uh, if you can, give your zakat during Ramadan, um, you know, your sadaqat as well to us so that we could, um, you know, we could uh, offer that service um, uh, to those who can't afford it. Uh, so with that, inshallah, I'll end. Um, and if there's any questions, if you have typed them in, I'll look them up hopefully. Um, I did answer a lot of those as well. Um, but if not, Zakallah khair for, for paying attention to me for this long. Uh, uh, through this experience, I think you learned that it's not easy to pay attention. Zakallah yeah. uh, khair, Dr. Fahad, this is a, a wonderful, a wonderful lecture, mashallah. And, and, and actually, there's. Were you actually paying uh, attention, Fahad? Or you, you kind of <laughs> to... I was, I was paying attention. Thank you. <laughs>